it is easier. It is easier to walk by sight than by faith. You cannot see conditional perfection. You have to accept God's promise that He sees you this way. All you actually see is imperfection, failure, two steps forward and one back. It is easier to base our confidence in things done, rituals performed, marks on our bodies, severe language, good works, or self-denial. These are things we can see, count, measure, compare, and consequently grow in our confidence. It is much harder to accept by faith that you are perfect while all you see around you is imperfection. It appeals to our pride. Each person struggles with a measure of pride, and a system that saves you while leaving your pride intact is very desirable. If faith requires the death of self, then a promise of salvation that allows self to live, to thrive, becomes seductive. In a work salvation, you can compare your status with others. Comparison breeds pride. This is what competition is all about. Pride breeds blindness, and blindness breeds excess. Salvation, conditional perfection, based on faith, leaves no room for self. Christ earns the perfection on the cross for us, and leaves no room for comparison. Everyone is equally perfect in Christ. Salvation, conditional perfection, by faith in Christ, humbles the heart and opens the eyes. It offers power over others. A human system requires humans to oversee it, and religious power is every bit as enjoyable to wield as worldly power. Salvation by faith, on the other hand, recognizes that power is in God's hands and that He empowers people for service and witness, not for spiritual dictatorship over others. There is power in Christianity, but it resides in the Word of God and is exercised to build others up, not control them. Paul warns the Galatians not to be seduced by the powerful temptation to try to achieve and maintain a state of conditional perfection through a system of law and works. This method was doomed to failure, and they would suffer the loss of their standing before God as perfect through faith in Christ. 7. He encourages them to pursue actual perfection. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. These brethren were facing the dilemma that I've tried to explain in the last three chapters of this book. If I'm perfect in God's sight through faith in Christ, what do I do with the imperfection of my present life, the evidence of which is painfully before me every day? The false teachers had their answer. Maintain that conditional perfection by keeping a series of rules, laws, and rituals, chief of which was circumcision. Let us be your leaders and teachers, not the Apostle Paul. This, of course, had led to division and discouragement. Paul's response was to encourage them to walk in the Spirit, pursue actual perfection. This was not law-keeping, but a way of life that continually reinforced their belief that they were perfected through faith in Christ. Walking in the Spirit, pursuing actual perfection, would transform them in such a way that their lives would become a witness to others of the truth that perfection by faith was the only way to go. We read that Paul, in the last part of his epistle, will describe the nature of the change that takes place in one whose heart is fully convinced that he is, through faith, perfect in Christ, and pursues actual perfection through the Holy Spirit to confirm this fact. Summary Let us summarize what we've covered in this chapter. Paul is responding to Christians who are being seduced into thinking that they can maintain their conditional perfection before God in some other way than by continued faith in Christ. The teachers he opposes are promoting the idea that 
obeying laws, rules, and customs will guarantee their perfect status before God. Paul refutes and condemns these teachers and their teachings. He reminds the Galatians of the manner in which they were saved, Christ's death for their sins, the message that revealed this to them, the gospel, the messenger who brought the news, he, Paul the apostle, the status they're in, conditionally perfect, the way they access and remain in this condition, faith in Christ, and finally, the lifestyle that confirms this faith, walking by the Spirit. The next step in Paul's teaching will be to examine this Spirit-filled life, walking by the Spirit, an experience he will describe as the fruit of the Spirit. Chapter 5 Actual Perfection The more perfect you mentioned in the title of this book is a reference to the actual perfection Christians diligently seek through the Holy Spirit. In other words, the conditionally perfect ones are seeking more perfection, actual perfection, by living according to the influence, fruit, of the Holy Spirit. In this way, the perfect, saved, seek perfection, spiritual maturity. The key passage that this book is based on comes at a point near the end of the epistle of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 13 to 25. In this letter, Paul was refuting false teachers who were attacking the principle that Christians were considered perfect in God's eyes by faith. Their teaching proposed that conditional perfection could be kept only if the Galatians adhered to certain rules about food certain laws based in the Jewish Old Testament, and the keeping of certain rituals, the most important of which was circumcision. What they proposed in reality was the pursuing of conditional perfection by the keeping of the law. Paul responded by denouncing these teachers and their doctrine, and reassuring the Galatians that their perfect standing with God, salvation, was securely anchored in their faith in Jesus Christ. As for the practice of their lives, he encourages them not to pursue law-keeping, but rather walking by the Spirit as the defining mark of their conditional perfection. The point here is that God is the only one who sees conditional perfection. Man can only see actual perfection, which serves as the witness that what is unseen, conditional perfection, actually exists. The Look of Imperfection Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Our study has discussed the idea of perfection and its various forms. In order to contrast these, Paul will begin to describe what the imperfect looks like using the terms flesh and fleshly. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. This is a summary reference to what he has talked about so far concerning the false teachers what they're trying to teach, and what this was leading to, division, pride, strife, etc. The desire of the flesh, therefore, is imperfection. He says that if one desired the things of the Spirit, for example, actual perfection, even if it was not achieved perfectly, the thing desired was perfect nevertheless. Chapter 3 The Holy Spirit and perfection. So far in our study, we've examined two concepts of perfection and how they're related to each other. Conditional perfection. Conditional perfection is referred to as justification, salvation, righteousness, or holiness, to name just a few ways this idea is expressed in the Bible. This state of perfection is given to us by God based on our faith in Christ. It is a perfection that is the same in quality as the perfection Christ attained through his perfect obedience. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. It is the standard we will be judged by. God in judgment will look at our conditional perfection and accept us because of it. It is the status that enables us to now approach God with confidence in prayer and worship. It is the status that gives us the courage to serve and please God despite the sinful flesh we inhabit. His promise in Christ is that one day we will shed our outer garment of imperfection 
and will actually become what we are only considered to be at the moment. Actual Perfection Conditional perfection is a status that we are given by God, a status that God sees when He views us, a status we will be judged by. Actual perfection is what we and others see in ourselves. Actual perfection is the status of perfection we achieve through the help of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the Church, and our own submission to these tutors and enablers. Actual perfection is the way of life we choose to pursue when we become Christians. We are considered perfect based on our faith in Christ, and this guarantees our salvation and hope of heaven. Being this way prompts us to pursue actual perfection as a lifestyle. It would be ridiculous and foolish for the one who receives this conditional perfection at baptism to then go back to the imperfect lifestyle that originally condemned him. The only option available to the one considered perfect by God is to pursue actual perfection before men as a witness of faith and as an offering of thanks to God. For a non-Christian to do this would be frustrating and hypocritical because perfection through human effort is impossible. But for the Christian, the conditionally perfect one, this is a valid lifestyle choice because it affords him an opportunity to achieve two goals. One, the pursuit of actual perfection is a powerful witness to those without Christ because it sets Christians apart from all others. Two, it is a wonderful instrument of praise because the effort involved in this pursuit honors God. Therein lies the difference and purpose of these two ideas. Let us now look at how the Holy Spirit works in creating these states of conditional and actual perfection. The Holy Spirit and Perfection Much of the religious programming produced by charismatic groups actually perverts the work of the Holy Spirit. The use of Hollywood-style production values using lights, sensual music, manipulative staging, emotional appeals, etc., is done to create a spiritual experience which these groups claim is proof that the Holy Spirit is working and present in their ministries and assemblies. Many churches are being affected by this because they want to have exciting worship. They want people who attend their services to feel something. They want to prove that they also have the Holy Spirit in some recognizable way. Of course, there is nothing wrong with being excited or feeling something because of one's faith. These are legitimate spiritual desires and needs. The problem arises when churches try to manufacture these experiences through human, fleshly ways rather than through spiritual, biblical ways. The many efforts to change traditional worship styles stem from the false notion that if we can create some kind of feeling at worship, due to the music, the presentation, the introduction of new elements like drama or soloists or worship teams, etc., then somehow we will be more spiritual and thus more satisfied. The true results of this kind of manufactured approach to heighten spirituality is twofold. Elitism. People who manipulate spirituality in this way become spiritual snobs. They begin to see their value as Christians rise because they have a superior spiritual level produced by their different worship style. This, of course, leads to division because anyone who does not use their approach is somehow inferior spiritually. We see this kind of thing happening in the Corinthian church, where the brethren were misusing legitimate spiritual gifts, and, as a result, were creating disorder that Paul had to address in his first letter to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, and chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. No matter, whenever spirituality is falsely characterized or misused, Division ensues. We see this happening in our own brotherhood today, where labels like progressive and traditional are being attached to different congregations. When this happens, it is only a matter of one or more generations before there will be a visible separation between those who ascribe to one view or the other. It is a shame, because both sides are right in a way and wrong in a way. The progressives. Those who see themselves as religious progressives are correct in that there needs to be a constant effort to make the faith relative to each new generation. They are wrong, however, in thinking that superficial changes, 
and in some cases unbiblical ones, will address the need of the modern culture to know and experience God in Christ at a deeper level. This is only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit, not stage techniques or multimedia shows, and certainly not by compromising God's word to increase attendance numbers. The Traditionalists These brethren are correct in holding that any change that compromises scripture is dangerous and not worth the short-term gains that might be produced. They are wrong, however, in thinking that the way that they have culturally adapted New Testament worship and practice is the only way that these things can be done. I've seen many different groups, Asians, Africans, Caribbeans, etc., adapt the practice of New Testament Christianity in ways that we, North Americans, would think strange, but are perfectly within biblical guidelines. Rigid traditionalism does not represent the Spirit's presence any more than progressive emotionalism does. And so, manufactured spirituality leads to a kind of Christian elitism, which is most visible in our brotherhood in the progressive, traditional lines of division being drawn these days. Another result of manufactured spirituality is loss of faith. Faith comes by hearing the words of Christ, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. If this spiritual principle is applied and extended, we can also say that loss of faith comes from hearing words that do not come from Christ. It is sad to note that those who pursue manufactured spirituality and create the elitism that seems to come with it also produce a lot of burned-out souls. Case in point, the International Churches of Christ, also known as the Boston Movement, whose spiritual elitism based on their narrow focus of personal discipling created an incredible number of baptisms, as well as fast-growing assemblies for which they took great pride. However, their manufactured spirituality also created the most serious division among churches of Christ in the last century. At the height of their success in baptizing new members, one statistic rarely mentioned was the high dropout rate of their members. Some estimates put the number as high as 50 to 60 percent. This meant that to sustain their rapid growth, they had to baptize 10 people in order to keep three or four. And those who dropped out were not simply people who quit because they loved sin and went back to worldly living. They were people, in the most part, who loved God, but were so emotionally scarred by their experience with these groups or cults that in many cases it required special counseling and the passing of many years to heal their sense of guilt and anger. Manufactured spirituality is dangerous because it has power, but lacks many of the edifying qualities of true spirituality. The phenomena that takes place in many denominational charismatic churches will begin to creep into the progressive churches in our brotherhood as well. Charismatic churches experience a constant drive for greater stimulation in order to get the spiritual fix that everyone wants. As a result, services get longer and more numerous. Worship becomes more elaborate, even outlandish in some cases. For example, bands, plays, pageants, parades, etc. Eventually, the ones caught up in this cycle have nowhere else to go emotionally. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. Paul's doctrine was not man-made, as was that of the false teachers, but received from God through a revelation of Christ. Only the gospel has God's ordained way to be saved, conditional perfection. And Paul was the messenger of that good news. 3. Paul was ready to defend this gospel to anyone. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, 
If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Galatians chapter 2 verses 11 to 16 The maintaining of the purity of the teaching of the gospel, how one becomes conditionally perfect, was so important that Paul had challenged both Peter, who had great influence in the church, and Barnabas, his former teacher and mentor, in defending the truth. No position or relationship was more important than maintaining the integrity of the gospel. 4. Paul reviewed once again the manner in which a person received conditional perfection. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 to 27. Paul uses another image or analogy to describe conditional perfection. He refers to it as putting on Christ. We put on the perfect nature and essence of Christ when we believe in Him. Paul even reminds them of the moment that this transformation from imperfect, weak, and condemned to perfect, powerful, and pure took place in the waters of baptism. Paul has said in the verses leading up to this one that conditional perfection is not attained through a system of rules, laws, restrictions, and rituals overseen by men. Salvation conditional perfection is freely bestowed on those people who believe in Jesus Christ and who respond to him in faithful obedience, repentance, and baptism. One might ask, but these are still things people do in their response of faith. Is this not a kind of work? This is the most common argument used when denying the necessity of baptism in the process of salvation. The answer is yes. These are actual concrete things that people do when they come to Christ. For example, they listen to the gospel, decide to believe it, repent of their sins, confess their faith in Christ, are baptized and choose to remain faithful. These are all things we do, but they are not works of law. Here's why. These are all things we can actually do, but we cannot keep the law perfectly no matter how hard we try. These things are given to us by God as a response of faith to Him. Keeping the law, obeying rules, performing man-made rituals, these things were not given by God as the response of faith in Christ. These things are effective. Faith expressed in these ways do grant us conditional perfection and lead us to actual perfection. Law-keeping leads to pride, discouragement, and division what was happening in the Galatian church because of these false teachings. And so, Paul aggressively defends the gospel and its teaching that conditional perfection is received through faith expressed in obedience to God's word and in no other way. 5. Paul points out what is at stake here. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Galatians chapter 4, verses 3 to 7. In chapter 4, Paul looks at the matter from the perspective of the teachers and what their motivation might be, and he reveals the true reasons for teaching what they do. Power. By introducing this new teaching and discrediting him as an apostle, these men were trying to control the churches. Paul responds boldly that the gospel has the power to free them from slavery to uninspired ideas about the world and their place in it. 
free them from their own sinfulness and the condemnation caused by their imperfection. The revelation of God, the gospel, accomplished by Jesus, the cross, is what leads them to conditional perfection and frees them from all of this. They know about themselves and who God is. They have dealt with their sinfulness through the cross of Christ. Now that they have conditional perfection, they no longer fear death and condemnation. As a matter of fact, Paul says that their conditional perfection, here he calls it sonship, enables them to call on God as their daddy, an intimate term reserved for only the closest of relationships between father and child. Following the way of the false teachers will not only imprison them, but will cost them this special bond with God. 6. Paul warns the Christians. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision, that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Galatians chapter 5 verses 2 to 4. Before, Paul warned and condemned the false teachers and their motives. Teach false doctrine and you will not only fail to achieve your goals, you will also be condemned. In this chapter, he warns the Christians who are being seduced by this teaching. Receive and follow false teaching and you will not achieve your goal, actual perfection, and you will be condemned as well. One question that may arise is this. What was it that was so alluring about the false teachers and teachings in the first place? Answer. Adherence to a set of laws, rules, and rituals is appealing for three reasons. Perfection is the absolute standard. There's something wrong with the title of this book. Can you spot it? Here it is. You cannot have a more perfect something or someone. You are perfect or you are not. Once something is perfect, without blemish or error, you cannot improve on it. This title, by the way, comes from the book God's Way to a More Perfect You, Living by the Fruit of the Spirit, by Leroy Lawson. The point that Lawson makes at the beginning of his book is that the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is what each strives to attain in regards to perfection. For example, since atheists and humanists claim that there is no such thing as perfection, they have few options when it comes to self-improvement or self-fulfillment. Two of the more popular approaches they use to this end could be summarized in the following way. Be the best that you can be. Maximize your potential using your best skills. You can never be perfect. Maybe you'll not even be the best. But if you're the best that you can be, you've reached the only goal available to you in this regard. I'm okay. You're okay. I am good enough the way I am. You are good enough the way you are. There's no striving to be the best or better. No competition with others or self. The goal is accepting yourself as you are and accepting others in the same way. There are also different ideas about perfection among the major non-Christian religious groups in the world. For example, the desire for perfection for those who follow Eastern religions is different than those who do not believe in God or any spiritual life beyond the material world. The quest for improvement by these people comes at the cost of denying themselves any imprint of their existence in this world. The religions of the East lead their followers through various levels of training and self-denial to reach a point where they are no longer affected by the world around them in any significant way. When this happens, they say that the goal of their religious practice referred to as either wholeness, nirvana, moksha, or enlightenment, depending on the religion, begins to take place. In the Jewish and Muslim religions, perfection is more a corporate than a personal experience. Their perfection is tied to the success of their theocratic aspirations. The geopolitical and religious destinies of these people are intertwined so that the achieving of political goals is believed to be a fulfillment, perfection, of their religious goals as well. And then there are those who worship idols or various forces in nature. They share the common belief with atheists that perfection does not exist. 
The goal for these people is to stay alive and not anger the gods. Self-development is measured by how well one exploits nature without disturbing or manipulating through magic the unseen spirits that control the physical world. Christianity and Perfection Christians, on the other hand, are people who not only believe that perfection exists, but are called upon by God to strive for it in their personal lives as well. Unlike the atheist, humanist, follower of Eastern religion, or worshiper of nature gods, the Christian has been given a model for perfection in Jesus Christ. Christians, and I include myself in this group, therefore can know what a perfect life looks like because Jesus' life, works, and words have been recorded and preserved in the Bible by credible eyewitnesses. When, however, we begin to compare ourselves to Christ in this effort to be perfect, two things become painfully clear. One, we realize how far from the perfection of Christ we really are. Two, we learn that no amount of human effort can make us perfect as Christ is perfect. The dilemma for us as Christians, therefore, becomes the following. How do we obtain the perfection we're commanded to strive for while inhabiting a body incapable of achieving this perfection? I will try to answer this question in the following pages of this book. Perfection is the absolute standard of the Christian life. Atheists deny it and various religions change its meaning to acquire it on their own terms. But Christians actually strive for and embrace perfection in its purest form because they are called to it by Christ. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If we went straight to heaven at the moment of our baptism, there would be no need to strive for actual perfection. But the majority of us have a certain amount of time to spend on this earth within this imperfect body of flesh before we meet Christ to be with Him in the air forever. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14-17 to 17. This brings us back to our original passage in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 25, where Paul asks his readers how they plan to spend the rest of their lives, repeating acts of imperfection leading to destruction, or pursuing perfection in Christ, Christ-likeness, which will lead to actual perfection. If we choose to seek perfection, we will also accomplish the following. We will be expressing our faith in the perfect one, Jesus Christ. We will provide a witness for the truth and a light leading to Christ for those who inhabit a dark world. We will experience to a degree the perfect life of Christ and the joy that comes from this. We will create the tone and texture of the communal life in the church here that will exist in perfection when the church is brought to heaven. We will guard our souls from the continual pull of this imperfect world. We will be doing the most perfect thing that we can do, and in doing so answer the question, what should I do with my life? We will attain the greatest tangible rewards available here on earth, as well as those awaiting us in the world to come. Chapter 2 Conditional or Actual Perfection For believers, becoming more perfect in Christ is the essence of life. Of course, this only makes sense if you understand that there are two aspects of perfection in the Christian's understanding. Conditional Perfection My term for this is the perfect state one enters into when obeying the gospel. Obeying the gospel equals believe and confess that Christ is the Son of God, repent, baptism. The Bible refers to this conditional perfection in various ways throughout the New Testament. Saved, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, and Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 40. Born again, John chapter 3, verse 3. Justified, Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Washed, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Redeemed, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Righteous, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. These are all ways of expressing the results of receiving forgiveness and reconciliation with God through faith in Jesus Christ, His Son. His death pays our moral debt for sin. In receiving Him through faith, 
expressed in repentance and baptism, we are purified of all sin, blame, and spiritual imperfection. Because of our faith in Christ, we're considered perfect in God's eyes, or as the Bible says, saved, justified, etc. This conditional perfection has absolutely nothing to do with our performance, our actions, or efforts. It is given to us freely as a covering to guarantee our entry into heaven when the time comes. This means that when the time comes for us to face God's judgment, we will be judged in light of this conditional perfection. When God looks at us as the judge of all mankind, He will see the covering of our conditional perfection, not the degree of actual perfection we have obtained. This is why Paul can say in Romans chapter 3, verses 27 to 28, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is where the other type of perfection enters the picture. Actual perfection. Actual perfection, again, my term, is the actual progress that we make in spiritual development while we are still in this imperfect body, living in this fallen world. Christ is actually the perfect human ideal, and being like Him is the Christian's spiritual goal. When we are saved, justified, born again, etc., God bestows on us the state of perfection which Jesus already has. Jesus achieved this perfect state because He obeyed the law perfectly and obeyed the Father perfectly. Jesus earned the state of perfection by His actions and life. We, on the other hand, are given this status because of God's grace. We receive the status of perfection because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Through faith, we are considered as perfect as Jesus is, not in our own eyes or men's eyes, but in the eyes of God. The problem, as I've mentioned before, is that we, the ones considered perfect by God, live imperfect lives here in this imperfect world while we await the end of our lives. What will we do with the time? Go back to doing the sinful and ungodly things that led us to condemnation in the first place? How can we, who are considered perfect by God in Christ before all the angels in heaven, how can we dishonor our God and Savior with such actions and attitudes? Or, as Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Romans chapter 6, verse 1. The answer is no. How can we, who are considered perfect by God, continue to pursue imperfection as a way of life anymore? So what then is the alternative? The alternative is to pursue the perfection that has been revealed to me in Jesus Christ. This, then, is what I refer to as actual perfection. It is the day-to-day -day effort that Christians make to imitate the perfect Christ. The Bible refers to this exercise in various ways. Sanctification, Romans chapter 6, verse 19. Faithfulness, 3 John chapter 1, verse 5. Perseverance, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Holiness, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. As those who are considered perfect in Christ, we choose to pursue actual perfection through Christ. We do this because Christ calls us to this exercise of pursuing perfection as a way of life. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. To follow after actual perfection consciously is important, because if we refuse or neglect to do so, the pull of our imperfect past will draw us back into the life that will ultimately destroy our faith and the conditional perfection it produces. And so we have the two. One, conditional perfection, freely given to us based on our faith in Christ and protecting us against condemnation at judgment. Two, actual perfection, 
which is the spiritual exercise we pursue in order to confirm our faith before God and man. The more perfect you that the title refers to is the you who is constantly striving to draw closer to the perfection of Christ while in this human form. In other words, the conditionally perfect you striving each day to achieve actual perfection as both a witness of faith before men and a declaration of faith before God. Christians have no other options. Putting off the pursuit of actual perfection in every aspect of life is either a sign of weak faith, a compromise with the world, a lack of gratitude for Christ, or a show of love for sins great and small. Seeking the virtues that Paul lists in Galatians 5, on the other hand, proves that God's Word and Spirit are firmly in control and leading one to the actual perfection seen and desired in Christ. It is no wonder that so many blues, jazz, and pop singers learn to perform in churches. These people eventually leave because they realize that they're providing a form of non-paying entertainment, and they could do the very same thing in true show business, but get paid for their efforts and talents. Unfortunately, non-performing members leave also, but for them it is because they are burned out emotionally. The manufactured spirit can bring them no higher, so they quit. Congregations in our brotherhood who think they are innovative because of their progressive brand of worship do not realize that others have blazed this trail before them and found that it was a dead end spiritually. If the spiritual experience you crave or are having has not been created by the Holy Spirit, then your religious feeling is illegitimate and can lead you to pride or loss of faith. In the Bible, the purpose of worship to God was not simply to create a feeling in the worshiper. Feelings, gratitude, relief, awe, remorse, etc., were byproducts of the worship, not the purpose of it. People who come to worship should be coming to offer praise, thanksgiving, and to unburden themselves of the worry and anguish caused by their own failings and the difficulty of living as Christians in a fallen world. Simply looking for a pleasant experience or stimulation is looking for the wrong things. All of this is not to say that there are no feelings and experiences that result from worship, but simply to emphasize the fact that this is not the reason we worship and not the goal for those who plan and organize public worship for their church. You may think I've wandered off here, but I have not. The original point of this chapter was to demonstrate the relationship between the Holy Spirit and perfection. Here then is the point. Legitimate spiritual feelings and experiences within the Christian are generated by the Holy Spirit as he or she receives conditional perfection and pursues actual perfection. In other words, being considered perfect by God in Christ, the knowledge, contemplation, and sharing of this priceless gift is what gives rise to the experience of gratitude, the feeling of peace, and the emotion of happiness. These are the legitimate feelings of the truly spiritual person and are produced by the knowledge of and response to the Gospel of Christ, which is spread by the power and agency of the Holy Spirit. No music, lights, group, show, spectacle, or huge crowd can create within me the feelings legitimately produced when I respond in faith to the cross of Christ. From the very beginning of time, the Holy Spirit has worked in concert with the Father and the Son to not only bring the cross to bear, but also to guarantee that the good news of the cross is spread throughout the world. The spiritual experience awakened in me by the cross of Jesus is timeless and limitless. Its effect humbles rather than puffs me up. It joins, not separates me to all other believers. The cross offers my spirit an endless capacity for joy, thankfulness, and pleasure, and renews my faith with every reminder of it. In addition to this, pursuing actual perfection as my personal spiritual goal brings harmony into my life. Harmony between myself and God as I strive to please Him. Harmony between my conscience and myself, since I know that I am right before God. Because of conditional perfection. And I do what is right as I pursue actual perfection. 
I now consciously seek harmony with others and myself because I now seek for peace. I now bring the good news. I now am salt and light and no longer walk in the darkness. This pursuit of actual perfection creates a harmony that results in what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. Things about me that are a cause for joy, peace, love, and other good things that not only I experience, but others can see and experience also. Through the work of the Holy Spirit helping to produce these things in me, I become a channel of God's blessings for others, a conduit for spiritual feelings that others can experience. This is the way that Christians begin to experience God and share that experience with others. Worship, true worship, takes place when individual Christians who experience God legitimately in this way come together and infuse their singing, their praying, their fellowship, their communion, their preaching, their giving, and their service, with the spiritual feelings that the seeking for perfection in Christ has produced in them. When this happens, there are no more progressives or traditionalists. All are one in the Spirit, and there is no pride, no division, no loss of faith, but rather the building up of the body in love. This is the relationship between the Holy Spirit, perfection, and our experience as a church. Chapter 4 Paul's Teaching on Perfection So far in our study, I've explained the ideas of conditional and actual perfection and how these relate to each other. Very briefly then, Conditional perfection is that state of being righteous or justified before God that we receive through faith in Christ, expressed in repentance and baptism. We are considered perfect, considered as perfect as Christ is, and at judgment it is this conditional perfection that God will see in order to let us share eternity and joy with Him. Actual perfection is the ideal of Christ we pursue in everyday life through the help of the Holy Spirit. We do this not to accomplish conditional perfection, but as a way of glorifying God and providing a witness to others about the Lord Jesus Christ. What others see is the degree of actual perfection created in us through the work of the Spirit. This is what Paul describes in Galatians 5. What God sees in us is the conditional perfection which is complete and satisfying to Him. When we describe Christ, we're really describing what God sees in us when He looks at us in judgment. Conditional perfection, therefore, uses words like righteous, glorious, powerful, transcendent, eternal, heavenly, victorious, spiritual, and godly. These are the type of adjectives that explain our conditional perfection in Christ. They are words that describe something that is otherworldly without being bizarre or frightening. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 25, however, Paul uses the words that describe the state of actual perfection, a measure of which we seek to attain while in our natural bodies. These words describe a state that can be attained, experienced, and observed while one is in a physical and sinful body. Love, joy, peace, etc. These things do not earn me heaven, but they do provide comfort until then and witness to others that even though I'm still in a sinful physical body, there's something definitely heavenly or Christ-like about my person. And so, with these thoughts in mind, let us examine the words and ideas that Paul lays before us in Galatians 5, as he describes the actual perfection Christians can achieve through the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians Background the letter to the Galatians was a letter written by Paul to a group of churches that he'd established in Asia Minor during his missionary journeys. It seems that certain individuals had begun to instruct these brethren that they were not truly saved, conditional perfection, without adherence to certain teachings that included compulsory circumcision. In addition to this, these teachers were attacking Paul's credibility as an apostle and leader. Apparently some in the church were shaken by these new doctrines and were considering a change in their belief and practice. In response to these events, 
Paul writes this letter where he establishes seven important points. One, those who pervert the gospel will be condemned. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not really another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 to 8. This, of course, was a judgment against the false teachers who were, in essence, saying that in order to receive conditional perfection, salvation, you had to adhere to their combination of teachings and laws. Chief among these was the command that the Galatians be circumcised and follow certain rules about foods and other religious practices. This was a form of salvation by works, earning your conditional perfection rather than receiving it by faith which was contrary to what the gospel taught. Paul warns that those who brought another form of the gospel should be and would be cursed, condemned. Two, Paul was a legitimate apostle. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. For those of us who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, perfection is the standard by which we judge our lives, despite the knowledge that we are, at present, imperfect and unable to attain this state by human means. We continue, nevertheless, to strive for this perfection because in doing so we demonstrate our sincere faith in Jesus. Because of this faith, therefore, God considers us perfect in His eyes now, while we await our final transformation at Jesus' coming. At that time, we will actually possess the perfection that the Lord currently imputes to us by faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, chapter 15, verses 50 to 58, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Perfection is a choice. Choosing to strive for perfection is not something that one simply decides to do one day. It is the new way of living given to those who are freed from sin through the blood of Christ. People who live without Christ either take the I'm okay, you're okay route or follow the personal best way of life. But they rarely choose to seek after perfection because they believe that it is either unattainable or non-existent. However, when a person comes to know Jesus Christ, that person comes into contact with godly perfection in human form. This experience has several effects on believers. It confirms the reality of their own imperfection. No matter what they may have thought about themselves before, they now know for certain that they fall terribly short of perfection. It also gives them a vision of what actual perfection looks and sounds like in human form, something they could not know before having faith in Christ. It provides an accurate measure of progress in the process of improving oneself. For example, if I can see what human perfection is like and compare it to my actual condition, I can then determine the progress I'm making in my efforts to improve myself to this end. It offers a choice. Seeing perfection and imperfection side by side helps a person make a choice to either reinforce the behavior that leads to perfection or continue with the decisions and actions that lead to eventual destruction. The verse of Scripture upon which this book is based, Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 25, outlines this choice and the consequences that follow. In this passage, Paul explains that those who choose the path of continued imperfection, expressed in immoral acts and a life of disbelief, will perish, and the people who strive after perfection will ultimately achieve it. It is interesting to note that the Apostle does not describe Christian perfection by using absolute terms like the most, the greatest, the purest, or without any mistake or blemish. Instead of using words that describe perfection as a type of measurement reference, he says that perfection is expressed in virtues such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This, of course, is not an exhaustive list, but a sampling of what perfection is supposed to look like in a Christian. The Apostle Peter, 
in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 to 7, also describes this process of seeking after perfection, but he names other virtues that reveal Christian perfection in the believer. His list includes words like faith, moral excellence, knowledge, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, etc. I suppose if we had to, we could go through the New Testament and create a list of character virtues and actions that would fully describe the perfect person. But it is easier to summarize all of these virtues and qualities in the single word, Christ-likeness. At the start of this chapter, I said that after being saved from sin, condemnation, and death, we have a choice to make, a choice that Paul explains in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 25. We can choose to maintain a state of imperfection, which characterized our old life and thinking, or we can choose to strive after the perfection seen in Christ and described in the Bible by the apostles and others. If we choose to pursue perfection, we will need to understand some of the ground rules in order to avoid confusion and discouragement. The first of these is that there are two kinds of perfection. Conditional perfection. Conditional perfection is the state we find ourselves in when we are saved. When we are baptized, all of our sins are washed away, and in God's eyes we are considered His perfect sons and daughters. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 27. Our perfect condition is bestowed upon us as a gift from God based on our faith in Jesus, expressed in repentance and baptism. Every Christian, therefore, has conditional perfection conferred upon them through God's grace at baptism. This is what gives each Christian the confidence to come before God in prayer, confidence to try and serve God, and confidence to face death without fear. The awareness of our imperfection would undermine us in each of these situations if it were not for the state of conditional perfection that God bestows upon us through faith in Christ. Actual perfection. Actual perfection is the concrete and visible progress we make in our lives as we pursue Christ-likeness. It is the measurable improvement we make as we are transformed through our submission to God's Word and the working of the Holy Spirit within us. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Into the new image of Christ, Christ-likeness, in our lives. Actual perfection is visible. For example, when we overcome bad habits, when we grow in biblical knowledge, when we learn to truly forgive, when we develop our ministry skills and bear spiritual fruit that glorifies God. The actual perfection being produced in us is seen and experienced by ourselves and witnessed by others. The confusion occurs when people try to achieve conditional perfection by striving for actual perfection. We are saved because God considers us perfect in Christ based on our faith, not because we've achieved actual perfection. This confusion often leads to an attempt at salvation by works, which cannot succeed. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9. The natural question arises, if I am considered perfect in Christ, why bother seeking actual perfection? Paul tells them that the act of desiring the things of the Spirit will eliminate the imperfect things being created and promoted within themselves. James refers to this same idea in James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, when he talks about the wisdom from above versus the wisdom from below and what each produced in one's life. It is a decision every Christian must make because even though we are perfect in Christ, a condition we've received by choosing to believe and obey Jesus, we can still reject the Lord by choosing to pursue imperfection, the flesh, instead of perfection, the spirit. Paul's point, as well as mine here, is that we choose to believe in order to be saved. We must then continue to choose walking in the spirit in order to remain saved. This is where many theologians disagree. Some believe that once you have conditional perfection, there's nothing you can do or no choice you can make that can change this. In response to this idea, I submit that what Paul says here in Galatians speaks directly to this issue. He is speaking to Christians who are obviously saved, 
and thus have conditional perfection. He then warns them to walk by the Spirit and not the flesh in order to avoid suffering negative consequences. The logical conclusion to Paul's teaching here is that once we have salvation, we can, by our choices, still reject this and lose what was freely given. This is why this passage is so important. It is not simply a suggestion or a helpful hint. It is the continuation of our response to God's offer of salvation. At first, we choose to believe in Christ and receive conditional perfection for doing so. Next, we choose to walk in the Spirit in order to witness and maintain that conditional perfection. Now, some could argue that this was simply another form of law-keeping similar to what the false teachers were proposing to the Galatians. They taught that you had to follow rituals, rules, and laws to obtain and maintain salvation. Was Paul not simply replacing these with the striving after character traits and moral habits in order to maintain salvation as well? This could be a valid argument except for the following three reasons. One, the things pursued were perfect. The false teachers offered ideas of men, imperfect ways to achieve spiritual perfection. Paul tells them that what they are called upon to pursue is perfect, spiritual, from above, and therefore worthy of their effort. Two, the things pursued were from God. The idea that law-keeping was the way to attain perfection or to maintain it was a human idea and thus an imperfect method that would not work. The teaching that conditional perfection was bestowed as a gift from God and received by faith was from God. The teaching that conditional perfection was maintained by pursuing actual perfection, walking in the Spirit, was also from God and therefore could achieve its desired results. If God said that salvation was by faith and was maintained by walking in the Spirit, then that is how it worked. Paul, therefore, was not proposing another form of law-keeping, but, in fact, was revealing the very will of God concerning one's salvation. 3. Walking by the Spirit Actual perfection is not a form of law-keeping. Law-keeping says that if you abide by these rules, you receive the prize. Walking by the Spirit, however, is not law-keeping, because it is the Spirit that does the work in you, not you yourself. The part that you contribute to gaining actual perfection is the same part you contribute to receive conditional perfection. Receiving conditional perfection meant that you believed, you submitted, and you expressed your faith. But it was Christ who earned and bestowed that perfection on you. You didn't earn it through law-keeping efforts. In the case of actual perfection, you believe, you submit to the Holy Spirit, you continue to express your faith, worship, service, fellowship, learning, sharing your faith. But it is the Holy Spirit who creates in you the character of Christ. If walking in the Spirit were a form of law-keeping, then you yourself, through self-will, practice, self-denial, and human effort, would be producing the spiritual characteristics Paul describes later on. 